For the first time in nearly 30 years, a person was killed on a film set after being accidentally shot. Is Alec Baldwin going to jail? The camera crew was setting up for a shot when Alec Baldwin put his hand on the Colt 45 revolver in its holster and said, so I guess I'm gonna take this out, pull it out and go bang. What followed was shock and confusion as Baldwin pulled the gun out of its holster, a lead bullet exploded from the muzzle, hitting director of photography, Helena Hutchins, who tumbled backwards. Director Joel Souza also hit the ground when the bullet exited Hutchins' body and embedded in his shoulder. What the F just happened? That was the question Baldwin repeated over and over again. A 911 caller alerted the dispatcher that there was trouble on set. Bonanza Creek Ranch has had two people accidentally shot on a movie set by a prop gun. We need help immediately. Okay. Bonanza Creek Ranch, come on. So was it loaded with a real bullet or one? We don't, I, don't, I cannot tell you that. Okay. Hutchins' death sent shockwaves through the entertainment industry, which had just averted a crippling strike by film industry workers. Hollywood TV and film crews were still reeling from a 2014 train accident that killed Sarah Jones and injured eight others. Her death and now the loss of Helena Hutchins are raising serious questions about workplace safety on film and TV productions. So today we're gonna to talk about who was responsible for what happened on the set of Rust. Could there be criminal penalties? Could Alec Baldwin face manslaughter charges? And what about the armorer and assistant director who were responsible for checking the guns? Now, an important standard disclaimer here, we don't know what happened on the set of this film. Uh, we don't know what actions people took or did not take. A lot of that will come as a result of the criminal investigation, which appears to be in process. So a lot of this video is going to be speculative based on hypotheticals of what may have happened. So don't jump to any conclusions here. A lot of this information is going to change and a lot more information is going to come to light. But first let's talk about this movie itself. Rust is an upcoming Western written and directed by Joel Souza. It stars Alec Baldwin, Travis Fimmel, and Jensen Ackles. The plot follows a 13 year old boy who goes on the run with his grandpa after the boy is sentenced to hang for an accidental killing. The Los Angeles Times has the most updated reconstruction of what happened on the Rust set. Their timeline is based on interviews with 14 members of the crew, official statements by the parties involved in the search warrant affidavits. The events that led up to the shooting started at 6.10 a.m. on Thursday when six members of the camera crew walked off the set before the day's filming got started. Their resignations came after a week of complaints about unsatisfactory working conditions, including a lack of safety on set. In the days before the camera crew quit, Hutchins had tried to resolve some of their complaints by forfeiting a half day's rental of a techno crane, equipment that uh, enables photographers to get aerial shots. She hoped that by sacrificing part of her budget, the producers could spend the money on closer lodging for the crew. The lodging problem was so serious that it became a running joke. Someone ordered custom t-shirts that read Error 404, housing not found. On Wednesday, the night before the shooting, Jonas Huerta, the digital utility technician, wrote an email outlining his safety concerns. Quote, I also feel anxious on set. I've seen firsthand our assistant director, David Halls, rush to get shots and he skips over important protocols. He often rushes to shoot. I've had more than a few occasions where I've been close to the weapons being fired with no regards to my hearing. Sometimes he rushes so quickly that props hasn't even had the chance to bring earplugs and he rolls and the actors fire anyway. Just 10 hours later, Hutchins was surprised to find the camera crew was leaving. As she tearfully hugged the camera operators, line producer Gabrielle Pickle told the camera operators to pick up the pace and get off the set. She threatened to call security on them. That's when David Halls interrupted the scene to rush Hutchins away, saying that they needed to prepare for the day. Baldwin's call time was 7.54 a.m. At 8 a.m., the crew had a safety meeting. After a few hours, they completed the first shot lunch was called. Property master Sarah Zachary retrieved the guns that would be needed for the scene from a truck where the weapons were stored inside a locked safe. The ammunition was also in the truck, but had been left unsecured on a cart during the break. Crew members told the LA Times that Baldwin, quote, was pretty concerned about safety on the set. When Baldwin rehearsed this shot a few days earlier, quote, he wanted to know where I would be standing when he drew his gun. Apparently the camera technician told him he'd be standing in a different spot and he said good. However, before the fatal shot was fired, there was apparently a major security breach. David Halls told investigators that his typical onset safety protocols included him checking the gun barrel for obstructions before the armorer opens up the hatch of the weapon and spins the drum. Halls told investigators that Reed performed a safety check with a Colt 45 in front of Halls. Although he thought he saw three rounds inside the gun, he did not check them before taking the weapon in his hand. This is apparently a serious breach in safety protocols, which require more than one person to check the gun. 
Halls then ran through Baldwin's blocking himself, pulling the gun from the holster three times without incident. He did not, however, pull the trigger. And before Baldwin was ready to film, he wanted to do a quick rehearsal while the director and Hutchins lined up for the shot. Evidently, Halls is the person who handed the gun to Baldwin, and early reports from the set indicated that Halls yelled cold gun before giving the weapon to Baldwin. However, new evidence indicates that this might not be true. Now, Halls and Reed are pointing the finger at each other. Reed says that Halls handed the gun to Baldwin yelling cold gun, but he claims that she was the one who yelled cold gun. Other crew members remember Reed being the one who told Baldwin the gun was actually cold, meaning it held blanks. However, if someone had double check the rounds, they probably would have realized that they weren't blanks. A visual inspection would have showed that at least one lacked the small hole or indent that visually differentiates dummies from bullets. They also would have noticed that it didn't make the signature rattling that proves that there's only BBs and no gunpowder in the dummy round. But admittedly, these are small details, which is why productions rely on experts in firearms rather than performers to do the checks. But the end result is that when Baldwin started to rehearse his quick draw, he pulled the trigger and then watched helplessly as the bullet hit Hutchins. Several reports say that after the shooting, Baldwin repeatedly exclaimed that he had never been given a hot gun, a firearm with live rounds on set. But who has responsibility for gun safety on set? Well, as you can imagine, the use of firearms on set is subject to stringent safety standards. According to the website for the Santa Fe chapter of the IATSC, the Union for Film Workers, an armorer must be on set when any weapons or firearms are used. Quote, armorers liaise with the director of photography to determine which camera angles will minimize any risk of injury. During rehearsals, armorers coach the actors in the correct use of the firearms, explaining possible dangers. And every armorer and prop expert who has spoken since the accident says that productions don't use real guns with live rounds anymore, except in extremely rare circumstances. The use of live rounds would probably need to be approved by the insurance company ahead of time. And the first news reports indicated that the Rust set used prop guns with dummy ammo. Sheriff Adam Mendoza and District Attorney Mary Carmack Altwees have now spoken about the case for the first time. Although the investigation is ongoing, the DA declared the gun did fire a live lead round. The bullet was removed from the director's shoulder. This is a serious problem since you can imagine live rounds are rarely used on a film set. Anonymous crew members told the media that people were shooting tin cans with prop guns on the morning of the homicide, and there's a possibility that the prop guns were loaded with live ammo and no one checked the guns after lunch. Mendoza said that the gun was a long Colt revolver. Quote, it's a suspected live round that was fired, but it did fire from the weapon and it did cause the injury. That would lead us to believe that it was a live round. Mendoza confirmed that, quote, there was a complacency towards weapon safety, while the DA said that criminal charges may be filed against the responsible parties. Asked about the possibility that Alec Baldwin Baldwin will face charges, the DA said, quote, no one has been ruled out. Investigators have collected about 500 rounds of ammunition, including blanks. Detectives recovered two boxes of ammo, loose ammo in boxes, as well as a, quote, fanny pack with ammo, along with several spent casings. Evidence will be sent to the FBI crime lab in Quantico, Virginia for analysis. A prop gun is not a toy. TV and film crews typically use specially designed blank firing firearms. These weapons cannot be loaded with live ammunition. Prop guns add authenticity by mimicking the sound, flash, and recoil of a real weapon. And when a weapon uses a blank cartridge, it can still be dangerous. To achieve the flash, sound, and recoil, blank cartridges are filled with gunpowder. They frequently contain something inside to seal the powder in the case, usually paper, wood, or plastic, called a wad. And if something is inside of the prop gun barrel, it will be expelled at nearly the same velocity as a bullet. So if a blank is discharged at close range, the wad can penetrate the human body. And this is what happened when actor Brandon Lee was killed on the set of the 1994 film, The Crow, when there was a dummy round stuck in the barrel. The dummy round that was used in another scene should have been removed before filming a close-up involving the weapon. However, a 44 caliber Smith & Wesson revolver had been hand-loaded by someone who wasn't a firearms expert. The person removed the propellant powder, but unknowingly left the live primer in place. This caused the bullet to be separated from the casing without enough energy for it to exit at the barrel. The gun wasn't checked before it was used to film a close-up, and during the scene, actor Michael Massey pointed the gun at Lee, and when he pulled the trigger, the dummy was blown out of the barrel, killing Lee. And the cartridges may also result in hot exploding gas to mimic a muzzle blast. The gas can also inflict serious injuries if fired at close range. For example, in 1984, actor John Eric Hexham was filming the seventh episode of the CBS series Cover Up. Hexham was filming a scene where his character loaded bullets into a 44 Magnum, so he was given a functioning gun and blanks. When Hexham was frustrated by a filming delay, he started playing with a gun. Hexham had removed all but one blank. 
He put the revolver to his temple, pulled the trigger as if playing Russian roulette. And although the wadding did not penetrate his skull, the force of the blast created by the hot gas cracked his skull and Hexum died from a brain hemorrhage. And perhaps by now you've seen the similarities between all three of these incidents. They all involve revolvers rather than semi-automatic pistols because the requirements for an on-screen revolver are different than other pistols. Now it's my understanding that on a Western film set like this, film crews do use real revolvers, but they use several different kinds of ammunition. The first is a blank that contains a cartridge with gunpowder. It will shoot a flame out when you uh, shoot the gun, but it doesn't contain an actual bullet. The casing is crimped where the bullet would otherwise go. But since in a revolver, the bullets are exposed to the camera, you need at least one other kind of round. That would be a, a dummy round where it does contain the actual bullet, the round lead thing, but it doesn't contain any gunpowder. And so when you depress the hammer, the bullet doesn't fire because there's nothing to go off. So at least with respect to one of the main criticisms I've seen, why weren't they just all blanks? Uh, blanks wouldn't look right on film. But since everyone knows how dangerous dangerous prop guns can be, how could this happen? Should Baldwin have checked the gun himself? Well, given how complicated it can be to film guns, it's not as simple as discharging live rounds. It's imperative that firearms experts check these weapons. It's also crucial for everyone on set to observe safety protocols. For example, in real life, you're never supposed to point a gun at a person, but typically on the set of a film, actors point the gun at the camera all the time. But everyone in the line of fire would be wearing goggles and face masks. They also stand behind a perspex screen. Hutchins and Sosa were were apparently checking camera angles by looking at the monitor when they were struck during the process. So this is a lot of background, but it's necessary to determine whether anyone faces criminal or civil liability as a result of what happened. So let's talk about the liability of the cast and crew. And let's start with actor Alec Baldwin. When the shooting made headlines, Baldwin's political opponents immediately shared their thoughts. And of course, it's natural to point the finger at Baldwin because he's the one that physically pulled the trigger of the gun in this case. But there's a difference between an accidental shooting on a movie set and an intentional killing. New Mexico criminal law defines murder as the killing of one human being by another without lawful justification or excuse. And we've talked about the mental states required for murder in the first degree, which usually requires malice aforethought, which means that the defendant planned to commit murder without cause or provocation. Manslaughter, on the other hand, is defined as the, quote, unlawful killing of a human being without malice. Because manslaughter does not involve the mental state of malice, it's considered less serious than murder. And uh, malice aforethought is a criminal term of art that uh, I'm not going to go into the nuances here, but it doesn't mean anger necessarily. I'm going to assume that Baldwin did not intend to hurt anyone here. So that means murder is off the table. Now, New Mexico manslaughter cases are classified as either involuntary or voluntary. Voluntary manslaughter involves a killing that occurs during a quote, sudden quarrel or in the heat of passion. As far as we know, that doesn't apply to anyone on the Rust film set, including Baldwin. The crime of involuntary manslaughter involves a killing that occurs in the commission of some other unlawful act or a felony crime. Involuntary manslaughter also involves a killing that occurs while the defendant is engaging in a lawful but dangerous act without exercising due caution and circumspection. And an example of an involuntary manslaughter might be a fatal traffic accident caused by a driver who was texting while driving. And to prove involuntary manslaughter, prosecutors must show three things. First, that someone was killed as a result of an act of the defendant. Second, that the act was inherently dangerous or done recklessly. And third, that the defendant should have known the act threatened the lives of others. And prosecutors don't need to prove intent in New Mexico for involuntary manslaughter because it can be committed recklessly or through an inherently dangerous act. And the primary defense to involuntary manslaughter is that it was just an accident. A defendant can show that they didn't act irresponsibly or didn't know that their action could have resulted in another person's death. So the question is, did Baldwin act recklessly or commit an inherently dangerous act? Did he violate standard safety procedures by pointing the gun directly at people? Well, the early report suggests that Baldwin didn't just pick up the gun and start pointing it at people. According to the crew members who spoke to the Los Angeles Times, quote, Baldwin removed the gun from its holster once without incident, but the second time he did so, ammunition flew towards the trio around the monitor. This suggests there was something wrong with the weapon, but shouldn't Baldwin have checked the gun himself? Wouldn't anyone handling a firearm check the gun themselves? Well, Mike Trisano, an armorer who worked with Alec Baldwin in the 1998 movie, Thick as Thieves, said that, quote, he was great to work with and was very safe. I was surprised to hear it was him. He was always on the mark and very professional. He's not stupid. Industry insiders seem to indicate that it's totally normal for an actor to rely on the rest of the film crew to properly handle the weapons, especially when some of the crew have explicitly told the actor that the gun is safe to be used in the circumstances. And that probably makes sense to delegate this responsibility. Actors aren't necessarily going to know all the ins and outs of all the different firearms, especially when different kinds of ammunition 
are used in the same scene. And of course, if actors did have to recheck every firearm that they were given, that could create even more uncertainty and allow things to go wrong in different ways if they didn't reload the weapon correctly. So this sort of delegation, in my mind at least, as an industry standard, seems like it makes sense. So under the scenario as we know it, for Baldwin to be charged, he'd probably have to know that there was a live round in the gun ahead of time. A weapons expert said once the weapon is loaded, it's impossible to tell what's inside. And Trisano said that it was not Baldwin's job to check the gun. Quote, someone professional on set should have been handling that gun, this makes no sense. So then the only question is whether Baldwin was negligent or reckless in handling the weapon. It doesn't seem that we have any facts to indicate that, for example, he was playing around with the gun or doing things that someone told him not to do, which is probably what would be necessary. So although Baldwin probably won't face any criminal charges, the likelihood that he is going to be sued as a producer of the movie is probably pretty high. But that doesn't mean that no one from the Rust film will face criminal liability. Is it possible that Baldwin or others could be charged with another crime like negligent use of a deadly weapon? Well, negligent use of a deadly weapon consists of one, discharging the firearm into any building or vehicle or so as to knowingly endanger a person or his property, two, carrying a firearm while under the influence of an intoxicant or narcotic, three, endangering the safety of another by handling or using a firearm or other deadly weapon in a negligent manner, or four, discharging a firearm within 150 yards of a dwelling or building. Now, subsection three may be in play in this case. An early report said that the New Mexico police were trying to determine whether the gun would be considered, quote, a deadly weapon. And based on what we know about prop guns and firing dummy rounds and the fact that they may have actually been using real guns with fake ammunition, one would think the answer in this case could be yes. And some members of the Rust crew have put the blame on the assistant director. A script assistant who called 911 said, This motherfucker, did you see him lean over my chair and yell at me? He's supposed to check the guns. He's responsible for what happened. And there were also prior complaints about unsafe working conditions on the Rust set. On October 16th, the union that represents people who work on theater and film crews nearly went on strike over bad working conditions. The IATSE crew cited low wages, long hours, and unsafe sets. The Rust crew said that the set was unsafe, echoing many of the concerns that IATSE had when it threatened to strike. And just hours before the shooting, seven camera crew members working on Rust walked off the set to protest low pay and long hours. Crew members had been told that the producers would pay for them to stay in hotel rooms in Santa Fe, but when they arrived on set, they were told that they would be staying in Albuquerque. That's a one hour drive from the film set. That means that crew would have to drive one hour to work, then be on set for 12 to 13 hours, and then drive for another hour back to Albuquerque. They were allegedly only getting five hours of sleep. The crew also said their paychecks had been delayed, and three crew members told the LA Times that they were concerned with gun safety because there had already been two accidental prop gun discharges. Quote, there were no safety meetings, there was no assurance that it wouldn't happen again, all they wanted to do was rush, rush, rush. One anonymous person said that he was so alarmed by the prop gun misfires that he sent a text message to the unit production manager. The LA Times reviewed a text message sent before the shooting that read, quote, we've now had three accidental discharges. This is super unsafe. Deadline cites an unnamed source who said a gun had gone off in a cabin while someone was holding it. Quote, a gun had two misfires in a closed cabin. They just fired loud pops. A person was just holding it in their hands and it went off. An anonymous crew member tweeted that the crew had sent a message about gun safety shortly before walking off the set. Past and present crew members have also spoken out against assistant director David Halls. In 2019, Halls was the assistant director for the movie Freedom's Path. In that movie, a gun discharged which injured a crew member. The injured man was a boom operator who suffered inner ear injuries. Halls was fired and the armorer was replaced. The Freedom's Path production company confirmed the incident. Quote, Halls was removed from the set immediately after the prop gun discharged. Production did not resume filming until Dave was off site. Now, however, uh, the anonymous crew member said that there was no armorer on Freedom's Path, that Halls let a background actor take control of the prop gun, that there was no safety meeting and that several people asked Halls if the weapon had been cleared of ammunition and gunpowder, but Halls didn't say. The Freedom's Path producers denied that part of the story. And now we've heard about several incidents involving gun safety and David Halls. These incidents could clearly be relevant towards civil liability to the producers who continued to hire Halls and might have had notice of his past behavior. Now, producers from three productions involving assistant director Halls have issued carefully worded statements about what happened on their sets. That's because they might have legal exposure for injuries that happened on their projects too. The cause of action against producers would be negligence. The New Mexico Wrongful Death Act allows monetary recovery for a death that occurs as a result of someone's negligence. The statute provides that parties seeking recovery can pursue an action if legal recourse would have been available for a personal injury. And this is something that people get wrong all the time when someone passes away. The legal cause of action just doesn't go away. The estate can sue on behalf of the deceased person. Having actual knowledge of lax safety protocols and actual knowledge of prior misfires 
is the kind of thing that takes negligence to actual recklessness and might go from civil liability to criminal liability. Firearms experts told Variety that actors are given fake guns until it's time to shoot the scene. When it's time for action, the actor is handed the real gun. Quote, it is understood that when the firearm is handed to him, it is in proper working order. And that is a responsibility of the armorer or prop master, whoever is in control of the firearms on set. If there were prior incidents of accidental weapons discharge on the rust set and the assistant director knew about them, but didn't correct them or insist on greater safety protocols, it's possible that he could be charged with involuntary manslaughter. Prosecutors would need to prove that the staff committed a lawful but dangerous act, such as handling a prop gun and did not act with due caution. And remember to be convicted in the state of New Mexico, the prosecutor prosecutor needs only to prove that someone was, quote, endangering the safety of others by handling or using a firearm or other deadly weapon in a negligent manner. And that takes us to the person that's responsible for maintaining the weapons on the film set, the armor. The armor on Rust was the daughter of a legendary Hollywood armorer. And last month, the armorer told the podcast Voices of the West that she had just completed her first film, a Western starring Nicolas Cage. Her job on Rust was just her second as lead armorer. She said that it's standard to assume that no one on set from the actors to the crew had ever handled a weapon before. And that person explained that her philosophy was that films should always use blanks. However, she said, Some people really don't want you to dummy it for some reason, just out of their own, I don't know. How well, they yeah. want to feel comfortable, I guess. She could have been referring to the producers, directors, or other prop masters. We don't know if anyone decided to use live rounds on set. The armorer said, quote, I think loading blanks was like the scariest thing to me because I was like, oh, I don't know anything about it. But, you know, he taught me that. And eventually by the time I was like trying to figure out how to make a specific blank go when you want it to, rather than it hitting like the empty cylinders mm -hmm. and everything, uh -huh. Figured that out on my own. Explain um, that process. Uh, so normally if you like, you know, you open the loading gate, you put the bullet in, you have to put it right around to right before you have to bring that bullet, that blank all the way around to right before the cylinder. So then that way, the next time someone right. pulls back the hammer mm -hmm. and shoots it, it'll go off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you have to like look at the front of it and determine which one is the blank if it's dummied up, you know, that's how I tell at least. Yeah. The podcaster asked if the rest of the cylinder is generally filled with dummy wads, and the armorer said that usually it was. In a video of actor Jensen Ackles discussed the gun training that he received for the film. Ackles talked about gun safety on the movie during a convention for fans of the TV show Supernatural. Ackles said, They had me pick my gun. They were like, all right, uh, what, what gun would you, would you like? And I was like, uh, I don't know. And the armorer was like, you have gun experience? <laughs> like, what's a gun? <laughs> And I was like, uh, a little. I'm, and she's like, okay, well, this is how you load it. This is how this is how we check it, make sure it's safe. I'm like, okay. She's like, okay, I'm gonna put some blanks in there, and I want you to just go and and, and fire off a couple rounds towards the towards the hill. And I was like, okay. So I put the belt on, I put the gun there, and I walked out. And she's like, just make sure that you you know you pull the, the hammer all the way back and you aim at your target. And I was like, I was like, okay, I got it. And then I go. This statement might be relevant to the police investigation as well as the investigation by the state agency which investigates workplace accidents. He said the gun was loaded with blanks and the armor told the podcaster that that was her strong preference. This video might also be highly relevant to the amount of training or lack thereof that the actors and staff received when they were working on this film. There were also reports that the crew had concerns that Hannah Gutierrez Reed didn't have the necessary expertise. Unit production manager, uh, Katherine Walters, sent a Slack message on October 8th that said, quote, apparently props and armor require handholding. They claimed that there were other accidental discharges on set. First, Baldwin's stunt double had accidentally fired a blank after being told that his gun was cold. Reed denies that she told the stunt man that the gun was cold. She claims that she told the man that the gun was hot with blanks. Second, quote, a young woman from the props department actually shot herself in the foot. That round was a blank. And following the press conference by police, Hannah Gutierrez Reed released her first statement about the shooting. According to her lawyers, the producers hired her for two roles, armorer and prop assistant. She said being the prop assistant made it difficult for her to do her job as armorer. She said that she requested more time for training the actors and this was denied. She also said that both she and the prop master, Sarah Zachary, had complete control over the guns. Reed told investigators that on the day of the shooting, during lunch, the firearms were secured in a safe with a combination on a white prop truck that only a few people had access to. But the ammunition was left on an unsecured cart and wasn't in a separate locked compartment. Reed was adamant that there was no live ammo on set. She said she, quote, never witnessed anyone shoot live rounds with these guns, nor would she permit that. 
After lunch, Reed said that Zachary got the firearms from the safe. Uh, during filming, she quote, gave the gun to Baldwin a couple of times, as well as to first assistant director, David Halls. Reed denied that any of the weapons were quote, unaccounted for or being shot by crew members. And according to Reed, she locked up the set's guns at night and at lunch. Sergei Svetnoy was a crew member on Rust. He wrote a Facebook post blaming Hutchins' death on, quote, negligence and unprofessionalism. Although he didn't name the armorer, Svetnoy clearly referred to her, quote, I'm sure that we had the professionals in every department but one, the department that was responsible for the weapons. There's no way that a 24-year-old woman can be a professional with armory. Professionals are the people who have spent years on sets, people who know this job from A to Z. These are the people who have the safety on set at the level of reflexes. They do not need to be told to put the sandbag on a tripod, fix the ladder on stage, or fence off the explosion site. They have it in their blood. I'm calling out to the producers. Svetnoy said producers cut corners by hiring unqualified people to save money, and the producers obviously push back on that claim. Because it's not just the people that are on set that might face civil or criminal liability as a result of what happened. It's possible that the producers of the movie might face vicarious liability for the negligence that may or may not have happened on set, or potentially negligently hiring people who weren't capable of delivering the safety that was required. And not surprisingly, the use of firearms on set involves extra layers of disclosure and planning. Producers usually have to submit their plans for using firearms on set for review by insurance officials, or else it's hard to get a bond for the production. For liability purposes, Baldwin was probably entitled to rely on the assistant director yelling cold gun, but new details about the shooting indicate that we can't totally rule out homicide charges against the armorer and assistant director. Prosecutors would still need to show that the responsible person had a deprived mind, and in practice, this occurs when a person intentionally engages in outrageous, reckless conduct with a total indifference to the value of human life. However, mere negligence or recklessness isn't enough. The prosecutor must prove that the person knew their conduct was greatly dangerous to the lives of others. An example would be a person shooting into a crowd of people. So if live ammunition was deliberately loaded into the firearm that was handed to Baldwin by a person who knew the gun would be pointed at others, then that could be a murder case. But more likely what we're looking at here is a case of manslaughter, whether voluntary or involuntary, because it looks like someone just engaged in manifest negligence or extreme recklessness. So detectives will also take into consideration whether there really were two accidental discharges before the shooting, because that speaks to very, very lax protocols. And if that turns out to be true, that there were many accidental discharges, which should never happen, and the assistant director or the armor knew about this because they were responsible for it, then they might have some serious criminal liability, probably just not a homicide. And uh, Brandon Lee's family settled a lawsuit against producers of The Crow. The death of camera assistant Sarah Jones in a train accident also resulted in a lawsuit in addition to new protocols for filming on railroad tracks. I'm sure all of this will come out in an investigation, but plaintiffs will want to know who knew what and when. Were people aware that the crew had walked out, that they had complained about safety issues? Did people know about the other accidental discharges if those actually happened? Did people talk to anyone? Did they make any changes in protocol? There've been thousands, if not tens of thousands of movies that have used firearms since the Brandon Lee incident in the 90s. And none of them until now had resulted in someone dying. Now there's still a ton that we don't know about this incident, but it's entirely possible that someone is going to jail over this. And someone is certainly going to pay a lot of money. But this video isn't over. There is an extended discussion of the Baldwin incident over on Nebula thanks to today's sponsor, CuriosityStream. And I'm thrilled to announce my first Nebula original, Bad Law Words Good. It's a long form documentary where I explore the most common legal and linguistic comments that people throw around in everyday life though they do it extremely incorrectly. So strap in, cause it's gonna get really pedantic. It's a hilarious romp through legal misunderstandings, logical fallacies, and law and order parodies. And it's only available on Nebula, which you can get for free with CuriosityStream. Because Nebula is a place where we can experiment with content and do things that we couldn't put on YouTube. And we're thrilled to be partnering with CuriosityStream because they're the go-to source for the best documentaries and long form educational content on the internet. They even have an entire section devoted to unsolved mysteries and crimes. So if you like my videos, you will love the stuff on CuriosityStream. And we worked out a deal where if you sign up for CuriosityStream with a link in the description, you'll also get a Nebula subscription for free. And to be clear, that Nebula subscription is not a trial. It's free for as long as you're a member of CuriosityStream. And right now, CuriosityStream is offering 26% off their annual plans. That's less than $15 for the entire year for both CuriosityStream and Nebula. 
So if you click on the link below, you'll get CuriosityStream and Nebula for 26% off, or you can go to curiositystream.com slash Legal Eagle. It's a great way to support this channel and educational content directly. And it's the only way to see my documentary, Bad Law Words Good. So just click on the link that's on screen right now. Plus clicking on that link really helps out this channel. And while you're there, click on this playlist with all of my other real law reviews. So click on this video or I'll see you in court.